Wouldn't it be nice if we could be as confident in living a life of structure as we could in living a life of rebellion? To be a nerd, but also that extremely popular extreme sports athlete. Many of you understand, what if we could be that parent, but also be so dedicated to our own personal desires and drive for the sports that we want to play? Who in this world says these boxes that we all happily fit in are meant for us? Some of us are in jobs where we are begged to stay out of the box, but it is so difficult because it feels so nice to be in that box. When we walk down the street, we all do this. We see somebody, we pick out one or two behaviors and we suddenly say, I know who that guy is. We do this everywhere and it helps define our boxes even more. I ask you a question, I want you all to do this right now. Look at me, I'm up on a stage on a red dot. Please put me in a box. What if I started off with this person? What if I told you I'm one of the best base jumpers in the world? Building antenna span earth. I fly parachutes off everything. I was on the earliest days of flying wingsuits. When I was a kid, I dreamed of this contest that I just put in front of you guys that I run. Can I combine the most childlike behavior in a way that the skills of a grown adult can come and play that game? That is what I'm talking about in this talk. I was raised in the best opportunity ever to be normal. I had two parents that were special ed teachers. <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> All I had to do was uh, go to school, you know, get married, buy a house, have a baby, watch football. I did almost all those things in my own way. I can promise you that. And I did it in a way that was so to the chagrin of my parents because I was not what they ever expected this should be. This idea of duality is something that is so important. And when we think of this purpose of this talk that I'm coming to you for, I have friends that will tell me that I am nuts. I have friends that will tell me that I'm a genius. I have friends that will tell me I am absolutely out of control. And I have friends that tell me that I am so committed to my one purpose. I have friends around me that make me the person I am. And that is the point of this conversation and how I can help you all make the first steps to get out of the box that you all belong in. The first thing I wanna talk about is this idea of unbound perspective. We all think of the idea of right and wrong good or bad, Democrat or Republican. Does anybody know anybody that is all one of those things? Yet we put ourselves in such a straining situation to where we say we have to be good always. I am not good always, I could promise you that. But it's that pressure that we put on ourselves that makes it so hard that we have to fit into those boxes that we just can't get out of. The second thing I wanna talk about is the idea of celebrating your, different, your disasters. And I don't mean just, let's have a huge party when you get hurt. I've been hurt a lot. But let's celebrate our disasters in a way that we can learn from them, take the time for mindfulness, take the time for a break and figure out what we wanna do from that. In this video, you'll see that I'm on the United States parachute team. We have thousands of jumps of rotating top to bottom with the tiniest parachutes you could ever imagine. It's a game of darts. It's doing the same thing over and over again with perfection. But on one jump, there was something horribly wrong that went happened. And my reserve parachute fired out the back. And suddenly I was in a situation where I couldn't see. My, my teammate was dangling under me. And we were at a point where teamwork was the only way we were gonna succeed and survive. We would go on to land in that lake right there, Lake Elsinore. And we would land so hard that my teammates would jump in and save us. I would have about six months where I couldn't go below 7,000 feet doing what we do thousands of times because of the PTSD that I had and the fear that I had that we were gonna get in such a bad situation. But we would go on and actually win the world championships and get second in the world just two years later. 
It was that time of reflection that gave me a chance to realize what was going on. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. When my parents raised me, I, I, I went to college, but before I went to college, I was a 4.0 student in high school, but I was also doing 60 hours community service at the time I graduated. I would go on to the Naval Academy as a summer seminar program, but a week before I'd wrap my street racing car around a pole and I would ultimately not make it there. But fast forward sometime later, I'm currently the chief technology officer of a major Navy lab where I run all the research and development for a huge chunk of the Navy. I would go on to college. I was 23rd in the world in skate ramp, vert ramps riding, sponsored by Vans. I turned in all my homework via fax. My teacher said, wow, this kid has no chance of making it. <laughs> when I went to X Games on crutches with an ACL surgery, they even knew even more. When I did a half a backflip and ended up having a walker, I called them, going to classes with me, because I lost all short-term memory. They promised me, just go and you'll learn. <clears throat> go back to those parents that we just talked about. The third thing I want to talk about that I think is so incredibly important to all of us, and that is this idea of tribe. We all know a family. Tribe is a new version. You can invite your family, but they don't automatically get to come. <laughs> Jim Rohn says it best, motivational speaker, the top five people in your life is the average of who you are. I can guarantee you with my girlfriend sitting out here right now that I have no one around me in my top five that's going to tell me I can't do anything. When I had that bounce house idea, everybody said, go for it. Because nobody knows what the answers are. So when we think about our tribe, get rid of those people that are going to tell you no. Get rid of those people that are going to tell you you're too old. You're a parent for God's sakes. Start today and find one person that you can put in your tribe that is just going to be that motivator for you and not the automatic no. The fourth thing I want to talk about is creativity. And this will be the common thread. Creativity is the thing that we use in story. My child, who's 11, Tessa, is my favorite little human in the planet. And we've always told stories since she was little. Every night I'd make up a story. And every night we'd make up stories that had blood, guts, gnar, just super gross, like body parts everywhere. <laughs> and I taught her, if we can't tell a story that's unbound by creativity, how are we ever going to stand a chance of living our life unbound by creativity? Right? She would go on to win her school writing contest, but not after she wrote a paper that was so disgusting in the school's eyes that I had to go into the principal's office <laughs> and deal with what she wrote. Now we come to a turn in my story. Everything's going great to this point, but we haven't got to the rock bottom low of my life, which for a lot of reasons was the rock bottom. I ended up in Loma Linda getting studied upon like a lab rat because of the way that my, brain, my mind works. I wasn't yet the CTO of a Navy lab. It was deemed with a lot of testing, an EEG, an EKG, an MRI. I even wore a special helmet on a base jump so that what is my thoughts, what is going on? And a PhD student asked me questions every day for months. At the end of that, it was deemed that I was functional in my ability with my master's degree in fluid mechanics and my ability to be in a CTO lab position. But I was deemed to have a major learning disability called audio processing disorder. When you tell me red, I might actually hear black. And it's so bad that I could pass a lie detector test that I actually heard it correct. And about 4% of all kids have this dysfunction, this ability in their mind to not hear things correctly. Yet we judge everybody by the same box. But I'm going to keep going down this path of telling you that there's no way you can predict me. So what did I decide to do? Let's go back to the four things I talked about. I am now on a heavy perspective point in my life. I thought I was normal. Everything was from the lens of normal. But now suddenly I am learning disabled and I shouldn't have passed kindergarten. Okay, that changes my life. Second thing, let's look at that, that uh, celebrate your disasters. Am I going to go wallow and say, learning disability, I'm useless. Let's go full-time base jumping. That sounds like a sweet job anyway. No, 
Third thing, tribe. Everybody told me, Taylor, stop, 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 stop. Fourth, creativity. What did I decide to do? Well, again, to my parents' complete disapproval, I maxed out all my credit cards, about $75,000 worth. And I wanted to revolutionize the way that we tell stories. Because when I read a book, I can't answer the questions in the back, even if it's a fifth grade level. So I seeked out the best lighting guy, the best sound guy, the best producer I can find. And I went to the heart of LA in the arts district, rented a space, built a 10 by 10 by 10 apparatus that had all these best lights and sounds. And what did we start with? My favorite story, Bernstein Bears. <laughs> Papa Bear falls in the water, splash, <laughs> lights, sounds. Oh, it feels so good. This sucks. This is horrible. I want that moment my dad and I were on AM radio listening to things where I, I just understood it better. And I don't know why at this point. I said, I'm done with this. I left. My daughter stayed. She was five. She wrote a story with the team that was there that would change everything for a company I would start. I came back and she said, Daddy, I got a story. And again, imagine the best lighting and sounds in a small space. It started in a re teeny like a, a metal building. You can feel the fan turning on top. You can see lights coming through. Amazing what theater lighting and sound could do. Suddenly this wad of something came through a glass window, glass breaking everywhere, landed in the middle of the room. Little critters ran everywhere. The lights went bright white, bright dark, all the way to white, and then a loud squeal noise. And my daughter had jumped up on me. She was so scared. I was like, it's your story. But suddenly I looked at all my friends there and I said, we just discovered something and I have no clue what it was. We called it minimally defined immersion. What if I can make you feel immersed, but do it in a way that I don't give you the answers? What if I can leave details out? Is this sounding like life? It should, it's my life. <laughs> it's life. Why can't storytelling be the same thing? I would go on with this company and make a, an apparatus that was much smaller, a tent, that had thousands of LEDs now instead of theater lighting. Same concept, but a different idea. And then I realized immediately that I have audio processing disorder. Kids with autism share this same, this same dysfunction in some ways. What if I start working with them? And next thing you know, I'm, in, I'm with 40, 50 different families with autism coming in with their therapists and their headphones and telling stories in this apparatus I had set up at the Bournes Youth Innovation Center in Riverside. It was the best moment of my life. I'd sit there and tell stories for an hour and these kids with autism would sit there and their moms would cry and give me a hug afterwards and like, why are they sitting there? And I was like, cause I'm reading them a story and I'm not telling them what to think. Can you imagine a population that doesn't wanna to be told how to think? And I'm one of them. Then something really glorious happened to me. I had a, a kid named David, he was 14 years old, come in, headphones on, therapist in tow. And I started the stories like I normally do. They go from simple to, to hard, they go from uh, quiet to loud, they go from uh, low frequency to high frequency. I wanna make sure we're not you know, messing kids up, basically. And when he started getting through that, I said, David, there's something odd about you. I said, can I try something? And he said, sure. So I pulled out an old story that we had no story to. It was just the Tessa's story that she made, just put on steroids, it lasted forever. And next thing you know, I'm playing this, I don't know, 60 Q story. And I asked David at the end, David, can you tell me what it is you just heard? Tell me the story. And on GoPro, he told me a story that matched the same time as that and matched every single lighting and sound cue. He would go on and tell his mom deeper and deeper versions of the story that still matched every lighting and sound cue. And I said, David, you have a superpower. Like there's nobody in this audience that can do that. I can almost give, there might be one David, right? So let's come to a conclusion on this. What can we all learn from this? I feel like there's a lot of kids with autism that wanna be in a box, that wanna be told they're normal because of the pressures of those of us that live in a box. And that is so wrong. Those of us that are living in a box should get out. And those autistic kids should be welcoming us to where they are. So 
So I honestly think that we can learn from an old school base jumper that's hurt himself more than anybody else, that's senior in a Navy lab, that's trying his best to help kids with autism, that we are better when we are not in a box. And I'll tell you one thing that I believe with all my heart, I don't think the boxes are changing the world. So if you believe the world needs to change, start making your little tribe with people that don't even know what a box is. And let's all move forward from there. And last thing I will say is my parents keep telling me, why can't you just be normal? I think I won. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>